turbines for isentropic efficiency. It also relates to compressors and to pumps. Although when we do a Rankine calculation, we'll see pumps aren't a very big deal for that. But isentropic efficiency can relate to turbines and it can also relate specifically to compressors. Uh, and so that's a thing. And I gave the efficiencies of both, but I only did a calculation on one of those. So just be aware they, they apply. The work and heat analogy. So from that, we get that we can look at the area within a TS diagram or within a PV diagram and get our work net and our Q net. We're going to use that extensively for the advanced Rankine cycle and we'll talk about it in the vapor compression refrigeration cycle as well. So we'll see that in both. Uh, so I wanted to introduce it there. And then we did the Rankine cycle. So this is, I consider it steam power, but it doesn't have to be H2O. Uh, but it's a steam power cycle. And so you're heating up upper fluid and boiling it, running it through a turbine and then recondensing it and pumping it. The pump's giving you pressure, the turbine uh, is taking the energy out and giving you generally electricity. That's what we use it for. So that's where we finished up last week. Before we get into the lecture too much, now that the quiz is over, I think you've got three assessments remaining for this class. I think you've got, oh, we've got labs as well. But you've got a, an assignment due. When's the assignment due? Two weeks Friday, Friday of week 11. Excellent. Is that right, sorry? I'm sorry, were they gasps of shock? Okay, radio. So it's Tuesday of week nine. So you've got, you've got some time. You've got two and a half weeks of time. Disregarding the, your work for other subjects. So you've got an assignment. You've got a lab report, and I know that's due Friday of week 13. So that's worth only eight. And then you've got a final exam worth 40%, okay, for the subject. When do you have to pass the final exam, pass the course? You don't. For, for 2400, I know that um, Dr. Kellerman was doing that. Uh, there are enough people failing this course as it is not to have to put that into place. The final exam for the subject used to be 60%. So th this subject used to be assessed 15% um, class test one, 15% class test two, 60% uh, final exam and 10% your labs. So four labs at two and a half percent. It was basically an attendance mark, 10% um, and then 90% exams. Uh, I feel that the learning is better spread to have a 40% exam. And the exam used to be three hours and now we can only do two hour exams. So I felt like 40% was as much as I can in good conscience assess over two hours. And then the 15% assignment was an addition, and then 5% extra on the lab, so it's 15% rather than 10. So I changed things up. Um, so those are your remaining assessments for the class. So just be aware, yep, so you've got a lab thing going, you've got a assignment going. Let's talk about the assignment, because it's two and a half weeks away. Are there any questions? Alistair asked me a great question, which I'd like you to re-ask me. Excellent, good question. So the question is, can't find data on your assignment. Yours is the auto. Who's doing auto or diesel? Who's not doing auto or diesel? That's good, okay, excellent, good. Um, they'd be about on par with asking. So if you can't find data, I want you to make a, a good um, reasoned approximation, right? So with the auto cycle, and this is why I wanted to introduce the assignment. This is why it's written like it is. When we do the auto cycle in class, we say at the end of the compression stroke, 700 joules of energy is added. And you're like, what does that even mean? Where does it come from? Who knows? Who cares? Right? To me, that's not good enough. The energy comes from burning fuel. Your question is, how much fuel? Um, you've done a good job in going, OK, well, is it stoichiometric? That's a good nominal point, and it's either lean or rich from there. So yes, you're going along the right lines, uh, choose something reasonable and justify your, your selection in your report is the answer. And that will be true of, so that's auto cycle, any of the cycles you'll get some of the data and you can like pinpoint, yes, this is right, like this pressure is right or 
this state of the fluid is right. And then other things, you'll be like, there's no data. Well, how are you going to deal with that? How are you going to deal with that ambiguity? Um, so that's the answer to your question. Thanks for asking. Cool. Were well, there any other questions about the assignment? Um, certainly, I expect to see the Teams forum on the assignment start to get some livelihood. Yeah, go. Good question. For the analysis, do you treat it as pure air, even though there's fuel in there too? You have to make a decision, justify the decision, and when the outputs of your analysis don't match the manufacturer's advised real values, was your decision contributing to that, that difference? So that's like, I want you to think about it. So yeah, you can do a really simple analysis with a very complex discussion of what you didn't analyze, or you can do a really complex analysis that quite matches reality, and there'll still be a gap, and you still have to say, well, I took everything I thought of into account, and there's still, you know, yeah. So it's more, it's, it's open-ended in that sense. Of, you have to wrestle with it. Good question. Any, anything else about the assignment? No? Excellent. Good. All right. Uh, laboratory. Laboratory, laboratory. I couldn't think of a good way for you to submit anything on Lab T3. Lab T3 is on the Moodle site. I've made it live. Uh, it used to be a laboratory. So you used to go and spend two hours watching a demonstrator pull some levers um, on the thermodynamic process rig. I just, the lab is very busy. I felt like it was a low value add experience for your time. Uh, so what I did was I had to take that data in Lab T1. So use your data, the data you took, during Lab T1, so this is the expansion process. After the expansion, immediately you took pressures and temperatures, right, and that was your T1 information, and then you watched it as the temperature re-came back to nominal. Okay, that measurement is your Lab T3 measurement. And it's to do with, okay, what was the initial state with pressure there and no pressure there, and temperatures nominal? What was your final state where the pressure was even and the temperatures back to nominal? Uh, and what's, um, how much entropy has been generated, basically, as a result of that process. So do the manual hand, hand calcs. I'll upload a video of those hand calcs being done by Monica as well. That'll be checked in Lab T4. So that work will be, and that's your one mark for that. And then for the final report, I want you to look at everyone's data. So you've got a big data dump, okay, for everyone's data, because people had different pressures, maybe they had different temperatures on the day. Um, what can you say about entropy generation compared to temperature in the room or initial pressure and so forth? So that's our, that's our lab T3. You've already got the data, it's an analysis exercise. Now just doing a calc and for the report, reproducing that calc in Excel probably uh, across all of the, the data set. You can do it in MATLAB if you want. Just have to pull the data into MATLAB. So that was lab description, lab T4, is once again like the compressor lab, you enrolled in it. Please attend the session you enrolled in. Uh, yes, let's go there. Are there any laboratory questions? Questions about the lab, compressor lab, T1? Good. Anything else administrative that I missed? No, excellent, good content. Cool. So this is us. Uh, we've, now we've solidly trans, we've been in the process of moving away from single processes and moving towards cycles. And so we have done uh, the auto cycle, the diesel cycle. We did a dual cycle as well. I kind of mentioned that there was a, a dual cycle in here, but it's not one of the big cycles we're covering. And the Brayton cycle, gas turbine engines. We did the basic Rankine cycle, I want to do a calculation on that today, and then I want to do vapor compression refrigeration. So we're kind of tracking our way around like that. And then I'm going to come back afterwards. Who's doing, for their assignment, so we just talked about, who's doing a refrigerator, a freezer, an air conditioner, something in the heat pump realm? Good, half a dozen. That's fine, right? So I wanted to at least address you know, the basics of that early, and then I'm kind of going to go back around and say, 
well, let's do gas turbine engines for an aircraft instead of for power generation. Let's do advanced Rankine cycles and let's do, um, we'll see whether we do absorption refrigeration. Anyway, we'll see where we get to. This is something else I wanted to show. So that's just where we are in terms of our cycles. This is something else I wanted to show because I, I hope it's helpful. Um, look, it's not, without, without being mean about it, but I, I, need, I want to say it so that you are aware of it. Uh, for question two last night, at least one person was using the ideal gas equations to calculate the final pressure and so forth of the, um, of the liquid water, right? So it's, it's water and it was boiling, okay? So I want you to, and, and the people who come here are the, I assume the higher end performers. So uh, the first thing you do is uh, determine whether you're dealing with an ideal gas or a pure substance because the way we relate to them is different. For ideal gases in this subject, we almost exclusively use formulas. PV equals MRT, PV to the power of N equals PV to the power of N, PV on T equals PVT, right? So we've got formulas for ideal gases. For pure substances, we use tables to determine their properties, their state properties at different places. Um, and then if a process is transient, so something's changing over time, right? This would be the Otto and diesel cycle, right? So for us, so this is then cycles, so internal combustion engines there, use that. If you're using an ideal gas in a steady state way, so there's a flow and it's consistent over time, right? Then if you're dealing with ideal gas, you're probably dealing with a Brayton cycle. If you're dealing with a pure substance, you're either doing one of the other two things we're doing today, Rankine and vapor compression. Um, there's a reverse Brayton cycle in here, uh, you know, but you know, the, big, the big ticket items, other cycles on there. So if we're talking about cycles, we're talking about those uh, and how you solve those is kind of what we're focusing on. Sorry, I just want to give some more context. This is where we are. This is where the subject is. One more thing, then I'll, then I'll lecture proper. Thermos are really like you don't get it and then it clicks and you get it. It's very much step change in your thinking. So you, if you haven't got it yet, the response to that is pushing harder to the subject because you get it and it clicks and it works. Um, it's a really hard subject to teach and it has a really high failure rate, which makes me look bad and that's fine. Um, and, and sorry about, about the effect on you as well. But it's hard, it's hard to teach and students later on, when they look back at Thermo, go, oh, is that it? Like linear interpolation, really tough threshold concept. People struggle with it. Like in third and fourth year, you look back and go, oh, yeah, table, I can look at a table. Um, you know, that wasn't, Phil made a really big deal. So anyway, whatever. So you probably disrespect what you learn, but like what, remember, it's hard now, right? Um, but it won't be hard once you've got it. So just to encourage you with that. Okay, good, that's me. Similar Rankine cycle. So, power generation generally coal fired here. Uh, lots of great YouTube videos on organic Rankine cycles, so solar thermal or geothermal. By the time you're using solar thermal, you're probably not using water as your working fluid. You're probably using a refrigerant, uh, interestingly enough. And geothermal, depending on what temperatures you can achieve, you might not be using water as your working fluid. I left the lecture slides in, but I don't want to go through them unless anyone had any questions. I wanted to go to the calculation and do that. So we talked about cooling towers. We talked about why you would and would not use steam power. Like I said, one of the governments recently signed a big deal for gas power. Um, so they decided not to go steam power. We did some calcs. I had someone ask, and it was, I don't know, it's a good question, right? For some cycles we seem to be doing, Q minus W equals, well in this case M, right? delta H, and some of the time we seem to be doing Q minus W equals delta U, right? So you might have thought that this was the first law, 
and, and lock that away in your memory as the first law. But then we're coming to our open steady state steady flow systems and we're using this. We're using delta H here, right? I want you to go back to the whole first law. Okay, so this is the first law for steady state steady flow systems. This is the first law for steady state steady flow systems. So it's already got some terms cancelled out, okay? For our first law, this ends up looking like our first law for closed transient systems, okay? The reason that the first law produces two things that uh, end up being quite different, looking quite different, is you cancel different things out. So for your, so this is closed. For your closed system, you have no mass flow, and you do have a change, so this is delta U, so you do have a change in the energy of the system over time. It's a transient process. For your steady state, steady flow systems, you do have a mass flow, but you don't have a change in the system over time. It stays constant. So just go back to the fully written out first law. It's quite long, it's in your formula sheet from last night. Um, it's quite long and just go through the mental exercise yourself of what do I cancel out for the Otto cycle? What do I cancel out for the Rankine cycle or Brayton? And how does that lead to two different first laws right at the end of that process? Um, it's one of those things like just go through it yourself um, and get comfortable with it. Cool, we did that analysis. We talked about the fact there's two different ways to calculate work in a pump. I'll show them both and why I prefer one over the other. All right, and this is the question. So let's open one note and we'll have a look at that. Oh, we should talk about that as well. Basic drawing itself. Cool. Consider a steam power plant. So you can do this too if you like. You can, you can start to work on it. Um, think what the first step's going to be, because I'm, I'm guaranteed to ask you. Uh, consider a steam power plant operating on a simple ideal. Simple. There's only four um, components. Uh, ideal, that says some things about the states of the different fluids. The steam enters the turbine at 5 MPa and 350 C and is condensed in the condenser at 80 kPa. It feels like we don't have enough information but we'll find that the information about the states that we need, that we feels like we don't have, is wrapped up in the word ideal. Oh. <clears throat> so we need to remember, recall, what's wrapped up that, that thought ideal. All right, what's the first thing I'm likely to do when trying to solve a cycle problem? Table, good, all right. You'll find that ideal gases and uh, pure substances, you, you track different properties, but how many states are there? I feel like there's four states, so I'm going to say one, Two, three, four. I'm going to track pressure and temperature and X and H and S. And I would, uh, yeah, I will. I would normally write the units here as well. Kilojoules per kilogram, kilojoules per kilogram, Kelvin. Just with these sorts of things, it's, it's interesting because all of our calculations generally, so we'll say what's the work of the pump, how much power do you get out of the turbine, um, how much heat do you add in the boiler, those sorts of things, right? They are all enthalpy related questions. Things like how much entropy is generated through the process. Um, well, that's generally, you have uh, some revision of that. Uh, entropy related questions, right? But the things that you measure, right? You can measure pressure. You use a pressure gauge. You can measure pressure. You can, use, you can measure temperature, generally with a thermocouple. 
uh, and you can observe quality, certainly when it's in a, in a saturated vapor or saturated liquid state. So the top three things are the things that you can observe and will typically be given to you in questions because they're typically the things you can observe in industry. The bottom two things are the things you use for calculations. So typically you're trying to work your way down the table. Um, so what are the things that we know? Steam enters the turbine at a pressure of five angle So we know that the pressure at two and the pressure at three is the same because there's no pressure drop through an ideal boiler. That's the word ideal. So pressure two and three is five megapascals. And condenser the dense condenser at 80 kilopascals. And again, there's no pressure loss through the condenser. So pressure one and four are 0 0.08 and 0 0.08. I might need some vertical lines. Temperature enters the turbine at 350 degrees C. So that's the temperature of state point three is 350. And that's all we're given. So do we have two independent intrinsic uh, variables that we can use to calculate our states? Well, it feels like we do for state point three. Feels like for state point three, five megapascals and 350 degrees C should relate to a particular state. And we've got two independent intrinsic variables. But what else do we know from the fact that it's an ideal Rankine cycle? An ideal Rankine cycle will have saturated liquid water coming out of the condenser. So state point one will have an X of zero. So that's nice. So that gives, now gives us two independent intrinsic variables. So it feels like we can calculate state point one, seven, three, and we know the turbine is ideal because it's an ideal Rankine cycle. And so when we calculate S3, we know that S4 is going to be the same as S3. So that's going to help us as well. And then we can, ooh, let's do specific volume as well in meters cubed per kilogram, just for fun. All right. Cool. If I, if I bring up a steam table, actually let me use this one. This will work. I'll bring up a document camera on the other thing. Sorry, I know that the document camera doesn't play well with the, um, yes. Um, coming out of the boiler, do we assume that it's also got a um, X of one, that it's completely vaporized? It will be completely vaporized. We'll actually find that it's going to be superheated. And so quality only exists in the, in the realm of saturation. And so the, the quality will be not applicable, actually is what we'll find. But yes, so you can, uh, yes. So you can know something about quality. All right, so I'll bring up that. Cool, good. If you have a question, sing out. I'm just gonna do this. So five being pascals and 350 degrees C. I'm gonna go to my table for superheated vapor. Five being pascals and 350 degrees C. How's that? Acceptable. If I get it wrong, let me know. 3068.4 and 6.4492. Cool. X here is actually not applicable. But it's a good question. It's a good, good thought. All right. 80 kilopascals and of X of zero. X of zero feels like it's gonna be a saturated and we're probably gonna be on the pressure table because we're given a pressure. So 80 kilopascals. Did I?
Thank you. Right here. 80 kilopascals and an x of 0 will give us a h and an s of these. Good. Yes, all. And let's take the v as well. Excellent. Now, entropy of 6.4493. So this, this entropy and this pressure feels like that's defining a point for me. So what point is that defining? Let me come across my 80 kilopascal line. 80 kilopascal. Is it between 1.2331 and 7.43? Yes, it is. Okay. So this feels like it's going to be in the quality region. It's not going to be superheated or compressed liquid, it would never be compressed liquid coming out of a turbine, but it could be superheated, or it could be in the quality region. It's gonna be in the quality region because it's between those two numbers. So what will X be now? And I might have to fill out a, fill out a thing for that. I said in the session yesterday, when I'm uh, doing these, I'll often do something like this, yes. 1.2231. One. If someone could do the calculation for me, that would be wonderful, but if you get there before me, that's good. And we've got 6.4493. And the question is, what's x? So x here equals 6.4493 minus 1.2231. 3, 1, divided by. I've got the negative of those two numbers just here, 6 point. 6 point oh five <coughs> seven three plus, uh, plus nothing. Yep. Point 0.1. Oops, sorry, 6.2. It's good. It's good that you're paying attention. You didn't bring a calculator, did you? No zero as well. Before there was two. Before or after the two? Before the two. I, you can see both these things at the same time. I can't. I'm going, what, what, what? Good. Did anyone get? Someone said 86, someone said? Wow. Oops. My notes say, oh no, my notes might say that. 84.1? Okay, good, good. Excellent. Percent. All right, and we also know, so that feels like, this is 0 0.841, sorry. We also know the temperature, even though it's incidental to what we're doing, the temperature is 93 and a half, 0.5 degrees, okay? Like I say, it's incidental because actually what we want is the enthalpy and the entropy. Uh, but it's nice to know, it's nice to have a sense for what temperature is doing throughout the cycle. So now we can find H using the same sort of thing. Let's move you. Ah, brutal. Come on. Must be a... Uh, Cathartic to watch me do hand calcs. <laughs> After last night, no radio. Yep. Yeah, point eight. Let's take those two numbers. 
So that's 391.6, and that one is 2665.7. Right. Zero point eight four one. And the question is, what is then H at this state? What state point is it? State point four. H at state point four equals zero point eight four one times the difference in H values, which is two two seven four point one plus the lower bound h value which is three nine one point six. If anything I'm doing doesn't make sense to you, now's a great time to say, hey, can we just talk about that? Like this literally this is this lecture is a great time to do that. And if one was to tap that in your calculator So in 2,304, good, I got a slightly different number, but you probably used 0 0.41. How many, how many memories does your calculator have? 26? One? Don't know? How many calculators? Does, how many memories does your calculator have? None. Nine. Nine. Right. I reckon something like a quality is a good thing to put in your calculator because you're probably going to be using that to then calculate further values. Because I think there's a little truncation error, but that's okay. Let's call it um, twenty-three oh four. As it turns out. Um, one or two in a number that's got a magnitude of 2,000 uh, isn't a big deal. So we'll do that. Okay, so now we've defined state point four. Uh, state point one, we can do the temperature of as well, just for a sense of completion. Okay, state point two is the state point that we're missing. The question is, what is going on at state point two? There's two ways you can do this. All right. One of them is you say, Let's say the entropy stays the same. So we say it's an isentropic process. The pump is perfect. So I say it's an isentropic pump. So let's keep the entropy at 1.2331 and take the pressure to 5 megapascals. And let's see what that does for us. We count up to 5 megapascals. Good. Oh, that's a pity. Right, these numbers are entropy. Okay. 5 megapascals come along. All right. You can see the values for 4 and 6. So the values for 4 is 2.8. The value for 6 is 3 as a saturated fluid. So if the entropy is less than a saturated fluid would have at that pressure, then we must be a compressed liquid. right? So if the number was more than 6.1 or more than 5.9, we would be a superheated vapor. If it's between these two numbers, we're in the mixture range. If it's below this number, then we're a compressed liquid. And that indicates that there's a greater sense of order in a compressed liquid. There's less uh, options for the particles and so forth, everything that entropy means. Um, so we come over to our compressed liquid table. Compressed liquid water table. Five megapascals. Oh, that's not better. I'm trying to get, anyway, you can read through the light. Radio, S of 1.2231. Okay, it's going to be between 80 degrees and 100 degrees because it's 1.07 and 1.3. So let's do that as an interpolation, just because we like that sort of thing. So we've got one point uh, oh seven two one point three oh three and 
1. And the question is, what is the enthalpy H? And so the enthalpy boundings are 422.7 and 507.1. Question is, what's that? And I don't mind doing temperature as well, just to get a sense of what's going on. Yep, I'm wrong. Three three eight point eight. And four twenty two point seven. And that's eighty degrees, and that's a hundred degrees. Can someone tap that into the calculator? Who's doing enthalpy for me? You are? 1.2331. Good, and it also is in the table. I just transcribed it incorrectly. Wow. Fast and loose. I prefer doing calculations in my office and then just showing the PowerPoint. But, because who's doing enthalpy for me? Great, good. Who's doing temperature? Yes, good. That'd be wonderful. Thank you. I mean, I, I just, I literally didn't bring a calculator, but I can do it. Problem is I can't see the figures and do that. One more question. Ninety three point? Nine five enthalpy was? That'll look. Take these numbers are. Other way around, doesn't matter. Cool, good. Let's paste those in there. At least you can read it. So, now what's the problem with that? The enthalpy was 391, this is 411.8, and this is 93.95. Right? Well done. So you can see that by going through the pump, right, going through the turbine, we've gone from 350 degrees to 93 degrees. Massive change. Large, um, large enthalpy jump as well. We've gone from 3,000 to 2,300, so it's going to be about 700 uh, kilojoules per kilogram uh, through the turbine. Through the pump, we've gone up half a degree C, so not very much. And in terms of enthalpy gain, we've gone up about 20 kilojoules per kilogram. That's one way of calculating state two pressures, or enthalpies rather. Um, the other way of doing it is to use work equals V P2 minus P1, which, is, which only works if your specific volume doesn't change very much, and that equals what was my V? 0 0.001039. 5,000, because it's 5 megapascals, divided by minus 80 megapascals. All right. And if someone can grab that for me. I think that's a simpler calculation. Um, and you get a very similar figure. And it works for pressures that aren't like, if I said 5 megapascals, that's easy. If I said 8 megapascals, that's really hard when you do it on the tables because you have to interpolate dub double interpolation. Using this formula, it's just the difference between 5,000 and 8,000. So I think this is an easier formula to use if you can recall it and recall its use. Figure? 
5.112. Doesn't seem right. What am I doing wrong then? I agree with you, by the way. 5.112. I got that as my enthalpy when I perform this calculation. That one is that, that one is that. 422.7, 338.8, plus 338. So I got that as, I didn't get that figure. I got 397.312. Sorry about that. And if that was 397.312? 397.3? Then we'd find that the pump, the pump according to one calculation, uses 5.7 kilojoules per kilogram, and according to the other calculation, uses 5.1. So it gives you a roughly equivalent answer and that would be just as appropriate for your calculations. So either way would be appropriate for your calculations. Cool. Now we fill out our table. We'll finish the example off and then we'll, uh, then we'll go. The question is determine the thermal efficiency of the cycle. But we could ask a bunch of questions. So typically you'll get like a cycle, and then extract, because there's no point making you fill out a whole table, it takes a long time to fill out a table, and then only do one bit of data. It would be, what's the work out of the turbine? What's the heat required in the boiler? You know, there'd be a bunch of different, um, what's the entropy generation across the condenser? You know, there'd be a bunch of different uh, questions that come out of that. But let's do thermal efficiency. What what is thermal efficiency? What things will we use to determine thermal efficiency for a Rankine cycle? Big picture, thermal efficiency for heat engineers. Good. Work net divided by Q in. Our work net, uh, we've got two things that are contributing to our work. We've got a pump and we've got a turbine. So it feels like we should subtract those values, add those values, um, take the, well, we want the difference of what you get out of the turbine and what you have to put in the pump. And then Q in is coming in our boiler. So Q in is between states two and three, and that will be the enthalpy difference. So let's do thermal efficiency equals work net divided by Q in equals Work net is going to be work of the turbine, which is between states three and four. So it's going to be H, H3 minus H4. So that's your turbine minus the absolute value of, because you want to subtract whatever work you have to put into the pump, 391.6 minus 397.3. So that's turbine work minus uh, pump work divided by QN, which is the heat you have to add into the condenser, which is between state, uh, the boiler, which is between state two and three, which is 3068.4 minus that one. Minus. Excellent, and I should have done H3 and 4, 2, 3, 0, 4. Yep. So the subtraction of those two numbers, minus 2. Excellent. And when we do that, We will get a thermal efficiency of one 
No, nope, that's all there. Twenty-eight point four percent. So that's the thermal efficiency of the Rankine cycle. I felt like I was really open in saying, if I did anything you didn't understand, this is a great time to interrupt. Um, everyone was pretty quiet, so it's fine. Um, how would we, because a different type of efficiency that I might ask is second law efficiency. What's the formula for second law efficiency for a heat engine? It's not enthalpies at that stage. Yes. Actual on the Carno, actual what on Carno what? Actual thermal efficiency on Carno thermal efficiency. Carno. Thermal efficiency. So actual thermal efficiency we've got as 0 0.284 now. Carno thermal efficiency. What's the Carnot thermal efficiency for a heat engine? Equals. One minus T lower over T H. Yes. I remember it's one minus something. And I think I need the number to be less than one. The low temperature is always less than the high temperature. So it's that way around. What's the lowest temperature in our cycle? You probably um, can't remember that, but the lowest temperature in our cycle is 93.5, and the highest temperature in our cycle is 350. So we can say 1 minus 93.5 plus 273.15 divided by 350 plus 273.15. In my table, I deal in degrees C because my textbook gives everything in degrees C, and to do otherwise would just be abusive and terrible. But when I talk about Carnot, I'm taking a ratio of temperatures. So as long as I'm plusing and minusing temperatures, the scale is, is um, not... As long as you're taking the plus and minus, you get the same value whether you're working in degrees C or Kelvin. As soon as I'm taking a ratio, I need to take it back to absolute um, temperatures. And what would Carnot say about our cycle? I'll do it. Cool. Do you get the sense that I'm more comfortable working in Excel than I am? Delete. There we are. Right, and so our second law efficiency then, 4116. Our second law efficiency is 69.5. So 69% of the way towards ideal with those temperature bounds. What I want to recycle back to when I do advanced Rankine cycles is it doesn't feel good that we're only getting 30% out as a thermal efficiency for our ideal case. And then we've got isentropic inefficiencies in our turbine. So what can we do with our Rankine cycle to improve that thermal efficiency? So we're going to recycle back to that when we cover Rankine cycles again. Let's take a short break, five or six minutes, and then I'll do vapor compression and refrigeration.